Welcome all to, uh, to all of you. Always delighted to have your company. Always delighted to see so many of you are interested and want to join and, uh, and to listen to our speaker on a Tuesday afternoon. We've got a great uh, pleasure um, and delight for you today in the form of um, uh, your professor, Julia Twigg. Is that right? Yes, yes Professor Julia Twigg, um, who is the Emeritus Professor of Social Policy and Sociology of the University of Kent. And she's written this really I think totally brilliant book um, called Fashion and Age. I came across this book um, probably three, four years ago and I found myself on every page and it's not often that you read a book which is so apposite in terms of how you're feeling and how your, uh, your thoughts and ideas about what it feels like to be an older woman in the world today, living and having to negotiate your way through issues to do with uh, clothing, uh, fashion and so on. And of course, I had started this business seven years ago called Look Fabulous Forever. I was very much engaged in a conversation with women about aging and about uh, and about their looks. So um, I'm going to start with just with a question for clarification, and then I'm going to quote the beginning of your book, and then we'll start to talk about it. So my first question for clarification, you described yourself the other day, uh, Julia, as a cultural gerontologist. So just, just give us the clarification of what does that mean? Well, it, it reflects the interest, the renewed interest in, in studies of older year, old age or later years, as I tend to call it, in cultural questions about how the nature and experience of ageing is, is actually experienced and understood by older people themselves. Because a lot of the literature used to be very much about frailty, about social care, medicine, all those sorts of things. And I've done work like that. But that's not the only thing there is to say about later years. There's a lot about the experience, about the perceptions, and also about how we as older women, particularly older women, fit into society, what kind of um, experiences we have. And that's what I'm interested in, and increasingly what other people are interested in too. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, so I'm gonna start off, as I said, because I think the first, literally the first couple of sentences of your book in the introduction, uh, they, they just hit me between the eyes. They, I thought they were so brilliant. So I'm gonna read it out. Uh, Fashion and age sit uncomfortably together. Fashion inhabits a world of youthful beauty, a fantasy, imagination, allure. Its discourses are frenetic and frothy. Its images glamorous and above all youthful. Age by contrast is perceived as a time of greyness, marked by retirement from display or engagement with the erotic and style conscious. It is associated with a toned down self-effacing presentation. So I just read that and I thought, my goodness me, if, if anything encapsulates this sense of how just going about your, you know, you, you, the desire that I still have to look good, feel good and present myself in a, in a positive way, is at odds with this world of fashion that really only wants to engage with youthful because it's it's you know moving younger it's it, it's uh, youth oriented and so on and so forth. So having just read that, um, I want to ask you, Julia, if you think that that is still that was historically true. Do you think it's still true, and is it changing with pressures, wider social um, and demographic? demographic pressures so that that's my first question to you really um uh, two answers about that one to say just very quickly that that frothy world of fashion and allure is always slightly at odds with the reality of what the, a big multinational industry providing clothes you know in a very ordinary way to the majority of the population so the fashion world industry is always known it's got this kind of you know wonderful glamorous kind of presentation and then there's a reality of providing jumpers for everyone sort of thing so there's always been that problem about it but on the change thing I think there has been some change you don't want to sort of exaggerate this but I think the situation um, of older women has got better and and I think older women are more visible in the media um, they're more visible partly as a result of the kind of jobs that um, women are now doing there are more women in visible senior positions than used to be the case I mean they're still not 
um, fully visible and fully there, but there's a lot more than there used to be, let's say when I was young, when I was, if we went back to the 1960s and things like that, you know, 1960s, there was scarcely any women professors, for example, that's not true now, and that's true if you were to go into finance or law or things like that. So I think there has been a change. And also I think there's a change in that dem the demographics, there are more older people um, more older people are both living longer and working longer, and these things shift what happen, how our understandings. Yeah, absolutely. So that there are changes, but um, my perception is that it's not changed an awful lot, and it, it yeah. needs to change more. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, I, I'm um, happy to endorse both those <laughs> ideas. <laughs> The flag that I co I'm constantly um, I'm, I'm con constantly flying, but from your your perception, sort of writing the book and doing the various research that you did for the book, what what is your perception about how people in fashion in the world of fashion actually treat the subject of old age? I think they just don't know how to treat it. Um, you know, they're very conscious, um, and and I talk to people in a number of um, clothing companies. They're very conscious that there's a market out there. It's a market that feels it's ill-served, and certainly the women I talked to said that. I feel that myself. Um, it's a market that does contain some people who've got some money to spend. So you know, um, and yet they find it very difficult to um, engage with it. In fact, I was talking to two American designers who we had a, a, a call yesterday because they wanted to ask about things, um, and it's difficult to know how to provide something that appeals to this market. It's not an easy market to define. I mean, I could say some more things about it, but I think that, that that's what I'd say their predominant approach is. And what about um, in colleges, like fashion, you know, colleges for fashion and design? Mm -hmm. Is there anything there in terms of courses or um, interest amongst students uh, about addressing that area? Or does that run, run counter to what they want to do because they are engaged in this frothiness, you know, this is the, the thing that, that I, I, I quoted first off. Is there any interest in, in looking at the older woman and the older body and, and thinking about how to design clothes for that? Well, I, I think there's kind of some people who, who take it up and I've been in contact with various, but they're the same people who might be interested in, I don't know, developing clothes for people with, I was going to say disabled people, but I mean, there is a kind of parallel between that. It's kind of addressing a market you're conscious have a need and yet, it doesn't fit into this um, elite dream that pervades the fashion world. And I think inevitably fashion students, when the students, when they go to study fashion, start with that, all that. They start with a wild collection of something, something. They may end up working in a, a, a company producing jumpers or something like that. But for their training bit, they're, they're still engaged with this kind of ideal. Yeah, it, it just feels like unless there's some kind of recognition that there is, is you know, something interesting might come out of that and therefore it might then become commercial and commercially acceptable and so on and so forth. It's this whole uh, problem, the dichotomy of fashion on the one hand and old age on the other and never the twain shall meet because, you know, because it, it, it's the thing that I get very exercised about, the taint, the taint yeah. of old age. <laughs> I'm know, afraid good I think that that is a, a, a right way to um, see it, really. I mean, as yesterday I was talking to the, these two young women who were starting a brand in, in the state, and they were asking me about how do you convey that you, our brand is going to be of relevance to this demographic group without, and they were saying, should they go in there and say in a feisty way, this is for the, you know, you were fighting for this, that and the other. Or is that off-putting? And I, I have to say, I thought it was by and large off-putting and that most women older women would want something that was simply integrated with other clothes that you know whatever style they wanted because that's another problem that this is older women are not a single group any more than women in their 30s are a single group you know there's all sorts of different ideas fashions you know styles you know think how various some women in their 30s are and what they want to wear well that's absolutely the same is true for women in their 60s or 70s Older people are, are more various, in fact, than younger people. But that fact gets lost because everything gets kind of lumped together. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, and it's it's sort of squaring a circle in some ways. I mean, it, 
the reason that I asked that and why, why I'm interested in it was because seven years ago when I wanted to launch Look Fabulous Forever, I was given a, a fair amount of advice that I shouldn't talk about older women. Mm -hmm. that I, I, I needed to have different vocabulary, that it would be off-putting, that it would, you know, there would be a taint element to it. Mm -hmm. And I, a guy who worked for Chanel said to me, um, you know, it's a nice idea, dear, you know, but it won't work, uh, very patronizingly. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt furious because I thought, well, um, I don't feel like that. And this is makeup. Beauty is one aspect of this frothy world mm -hmm. that you're talking about. So I did it unapologetically, but um, I'm, I, I wanted to do it via language, but I also wanted to do it by imagery, i.e. we would never, ever show our makeup on a face that was um, younger than we were selling to. You know, we would be mm. honest about it. We would say, this is what we're appealing to. This is who we want to have a conversation with. And we're going to acknowledge that there are changes as you get older and this makeup will work better on an older face. We don't want to have a conversation with anybody under the age of about 55 because you won't understand it. You won't get it. And you'll probably question whether it's, it's worth having. Mm. And in a way, I would have liked to have said to your uh, American students, let me talk to you about my experience because it was it has run counter to what you would expect by being unapologetically for old, uh, for older women i think we've done we've been more successful because we haven't been squeamish we haven't seen it as a taint and in fact i love engaging with this market because i find it i find it intelligent interesting and diverse that you know like you say different uh, but they're perfectly happy to embrace the notion that they are older and mm. that they they're, they're not you know they're not going to be put off by it i'm sure we put some people off for sure we put some people off but then they, they'd be put off uh, because we're not banging that drum about looking younger all the time now uh, another question for you um you wrote in your book that fashion is a source of joy and uplift uh but invisibility is an issue so do you think that um sort of dress and the way that you dress and, and, the, and this this world of fashion and clothes can, can it help with that do you think well, I think, again, it's important to emphasise women differ. You know, some women are not interested at the age of 19 or 20 very much. Some are give up. They, they, they feel, I've had enough of it. You know, I had interviewees who said, look, I've that, done that earlier in my life. I, I, just give me something comfortable and things. But there were other women who, for whom it was still a source of pleasure, self-presentation, review. It, you know, it's a kind of element of artist, artistic response thing. And um, that remained, um, and I, I think there is that variety, and I think that it still can be. And to that extent, I think it can be something that encourages people to feel confident. And since losing confidence is one of the things that can happen in later years, it doesn't always happen, but it can happen if you um, have a knockback, an illness, perhaps you lose a partner, or all sorts of ways in which you know our lives can be given a bit of a belting when we're older. And I think. Um, the confidence of wearing something you like and is new and or having presentation and makeup that you were discussing are, is, is, gives good things there. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, for sure, there is a, a, a group of women who have never wanted to engage in fashion and yeah. find it as a relief not to have to. You know, it's yes. like, I'm older now, I, it's a relief. I don't have to engage with that whole thing about the way I look. Who cares what I look like? I'm perfectly happy to fade into the background. But I think there's another group who, who, who start to get older and find that because they feel shut out from this conversation about fashion and, and looking good and all that kind of thing, um, they lose confidence in their ability to present themselves in a particular way. So, you know, you, you're no longer supposed to be sexy because you're postmenopausal, so you're not fertile anymore. You know, there's that whole thing going on there. Mm. And then it's like, well, who am I doing this for? And mm. you have to start doing it for yourself. Mm. <laughs> and that for some women, that feels very, um, I think, self-consciously almost vain. Uh, you know, but we've had a brilliant conversation during lockdown about getting up, putting some makeup on, wearing something nice and just feeling better in the process, mm -hmm. even though you're not going out, even though you're not meeting people. And that's the conversation we've been having on Super Troopers, this Facebook page that we uh, that we have. And it's been really brilliant. I love it because I've had several women on there say to me, um, do you know what, Tricia, before I found Super Troopers, you know, I didn't wear uh, ridiculous earrings and I wasn't putting lipstick on 
very often and I wasn't bothering to wear nice colours and do my hair but now I am and I feel great I feel so much better and it's almost like we've given permission to a whole cohort of women to say it's fine it's okay you know it's not about attracting a mate it's not about uh, those other things that you tend to think of when you're younger it's actually about validating yourself as a human being as an older human being which brings me on to my other, another question which it maybe is, is a very similar one you it's a quote from you again aging is experienced um, by many women as a form of exile from femininity itself mm. so would you like to expand on that a little bit what's what what was your thought about that well I think there is a way in which the experience of old getting older can feel like exile as you kind of excluded I mean you were saying this yourself from aspects of life that have been part of um exchange between women chatting about clothes wearing clothes these sorts of things and and particularly since um again it's it's to do with the erotic element you were talking about it, which is connected with femininity and um one of the elements that tends to happen as as women get older is they begin to feel much more careful about exposing parts of the body it doesn't seem to be successful so there are ways things that used to work I mean I, I don't know if others find this but certainly I've had this experience things that I looked nice in when I was 20 I don't look particularly good in now you just have to kind of recognize that you need to change your style in different sorts of ways and so I think that can be experienced as a form of exile um, from zones of life that are particularly connected with femininity, looking attractive, look shopping for pretty clothes, this sort of thing. Yeah, do you think it also anything to do with as our bodies change, bits of them become, uh, as we perceive them ourselves and others definitely perceive them as unattractive, i.e. now I cover my arms up. <laughs> Why do I cover my arms up? Because I actually think that they're quite unpleasant. I don't like looking at them and I don't, you know, I don't want to go out with, I will go out with a sleeveless top on if it's really hot, but I will cover up my arms a lot more than I, I used to. Um, I've got very sore feet, so I can't wear heels anymore. Uh, and again, heels are associated with a certain uh, quality of femininity, aren't they? You know, yes, so you put on a nice, a wonderful pair of high heel shoes and you immediately feel uh, better and, uh, and nicer and you walk differently and things like that. So I think um, also hair, you know, sort of, I've, I've got my hair now quite short, cut into quite a short style. It's more, it is more practical, but, but it's also to do with the fact that my hair doesn't grow long very well anymore. It looks better short. I think it does anyway. So there's this whole thing that that we tend to start to lose those qualities of femininity that we would we, we would have once uh, seen ourselves as having but what what you need what you therefore need to do is to find a way to compensate for that and uh, and find another way to do it if you like um, yes I think you need to change you need to recognize that things that once looked good on you aren't perhaps going to look good on you I think going back to your point about arms and things it's a very difficult one because really behind it is a profound sense that the old body is unattractive and you know we can be brave and say oh I'm not going to let myself think that <laughs> you know but actually we're talking about really very deeply felt um, cultural norms um, and I don't see, you know, however brave you are, you're, you're not going to be able to challenge all of those, as it were. But I think that does lie behind it, um, you know, that sense that, well, I don't know if I can get away with that anymore. That kind of internalised discussion, which I think all of us have had, um, is rooted in a kind of ageist interpretation of the ageing body. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's fairly, very deeply ingrained that, isn't it? That, um... yeah. It's, and it's very hard to go against it because I'm very conscious of it. But at the same time, I look at myself and I look at my arms and I don't like them. And I know I've been culturally conditioned not to like my arms because they're old. But at the same time, I really don't like my arms. So, you know, that, that, that's very difficult. I understand what I'm doing, but at the same, same time, I can't overcome it. Um, that's, the, that's the reality. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about agelessness <laughs> so going back to how the fashion industry uh, tries to get round mm. this problem by by presenting us with the, with the notion that we can dress in an ageless way so what 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 do you think they mean by that 
Well, I mean, I do see it as generally as a positive move, this idea that there is a kind of emphasis on the individual rather than, you know, their age, age, as it were, and that you can slightly sort of um, float above a lot of um, very harsh um, imposition of age ideas. But having said that, it is a little bit of a of a, um, an untruth, because I think, you know, I was again talking yesterday to these, to these two young women. I mean, ageless style clothes are not going to be selected by a woman who's 20. You know, it is a message about, <laughs> about age and you just have to sort of recognize that it's a softer, more subtle and possibly more positive version, but it, it, it hasn't transcended age ideas. I also find that, that agelessness starts to be talked about at quite a young age. In other words, <laughs> it's represented often in the fashion uh, press um, by women who are going into their 50s. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, they, they hit their 50s, which they which in their world is old. I mean, let's face it, uh, it, it, there's no question. I'm sure if you work in the fashion industry, it must be quite challenging to go into your 50s because you're in an environment which is incredibly young. Yeah. Um, I mean, my daughter worked in PR for a while, uh, not fashion PR, but even so, that's a young industry. And she was in her early 40s and everybody was younger than her. You know, she got to a point where every, everybody around her was much younger. It must be same, same must be true in the fashion industry very strongly. Yes. So therefore, they start to they start to talk at that age about agelessness. And and I often think, look at them and think, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about, because actually at 50, very little is, well, I think very little has changed really mm. as your body. You know, yes. you're 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 still able probably to wear those things that you've always worn very fairly successfully. I certainly could at 50, which I can't at 73. There's no question that that has changed quite mm. dramatically for me. So I see agelessness as a bit of a cop out, um, not least because it doesn't address the one of the issues that, again, I'd like to talk to you about, because you mentioned it in your book, the reality of aging and the fact that bodies change and mm. then clothes don't fit in the same way. Mm. I agree. I mean, a lot of the ageless style material will, will um, feature models who are in their 40s, say, and who have a very slight sort of, you know, mark of wrinkles or something, but that's really all, all there is. Um, whereas one of the things that happens as we get older and get into our, well, so 60s and 70s is that the fit of clothes in a way has to alter because certain things systematically happen. Weight moves to the middle. You know, you lose weight off your legs and thighs and hips and you it accumulates in the middle. Um, and similarly, um, busts lower, busts often get larger and lower. And that means a dress cut very close that's cut for a younger style is going to have the bust darts in the wrong place. So you either need to have it cut to have it for an older figure or you have to move into a slightly easier style where um, it, it's not so immediately fitted around the body. Um, but there are systematic changes and um, successful brands who aim at older people know about that and know to cut, adjust the cut in that sort of way. Yeah, um, we had a, a somebody on a couple of weeks ago, Gail Rolfe, who was fashion editor on the Daily Mail, and she was saying that there are certain uh, brands, and often the Scandinavian brands are quite good at this, so brands like Cos, who mm. can cut their clothes quite loose, mm. and um, and so they, they're quite fashionable, not terribly expensive, so they, you know, they, they position themselves quite well, um, and they're quite, they're, they are quite a lot easier to wear whilst not being obviously aimed at the older woman, you know, they... they well, they're... yes, going back to that point we were talking about earlier about integration being what I think many older people are interested in. COS provides a, a particular aesthetic. It's rather pared down, Scandinavian one, um, and it sells to quite a range of ages. Um, so it's not actually a brand aimed at older women, but it's a brand that's aware it does have older women shopping among it. Not all older women will like that, but it, it is able to accommodate those sorts of that sort of, those sort of bodily changes. You're right because of the cut, yeah. to some degrees loosish. It's quite an interesting one because it seems to negotiate itself very well through that problem. It's not tainted by being associated yeah. with older mm. women. If I go into cars in London, I see a lot of younger women shopping in there but mm -hmm. I feel comfortable in there too and some places I don't some places mm -hmm. I go in and I think I, I need to look as though I'm pretending to look 
for something for my daughter because you know they're giving me um a side eye i think that it's called um, can i just, can I just ask you when you went into cos when you first came across that shop were you yeah. aware of anything because when i came across it i just looked in you know window and wandered in sort of thing and thought oh, you know some of these and tried things on um there was no signaling i could see that suggested you an older woman might find something here i mean i did find something there but there wasn't a signal you're absolutely right there was no signal i think i went into the one in regent street and i mm -hmm. think i'd probably been into jaeger or something like that mm -hmm. uh, it was next door and you know i was wandering along and i thought oh that looks new that looks interesting i lived in sweden for a couple of years so mm -hmm. um and i knew it was it was part of that uh, i think it's part of h Nema. I've got that wrong. Anyway, I popped in and had a look and I just start, started taking things into the dressing room mm. and, and bought a couple of things I loved. I just thought they were really nice and they weren't expensive and they were they were beautifully cut, nice materials. Mm. So, you know, good quality. Um, so I, I think it's uh, it's interesting how if they successfully negotiate their way through it then uh, it is possible you know and that was that's a really good example i i just like to um to come on to uh again something that's a bit of a bee in my bonnet and that's to do with magazines and i want to quote something in your book i i love the whole um the whole chapter on magazines because again you know just reading it it's just i, I just kept saying yes all the way through but i want to quote this is alexandra shulman mm. who was the vogue editor for a long time and i think this is just so shocking <laughs> so she said i don't think people do really want to look really at older women as kind of exemplars of fashion and beauty i don't think they find them as such you could say why although I think it's obvious really. It, it, you've got several quotes from her and they're all quite damning in fact. And um, it's interesting because you know, Vogue is the Bible of high fashion in a way. And yet here is a woman who is absolutely saying, look, we don't want any truck with this ghastly demographic because they're just so horrible and nobody wants to look at them. But it's, um, she's gone now and it's Edward Ennefel. And do you perceive that he's doing anything different he's certainly doing diff different stuff around diversity mm. um do you, do you do you sort of sense a shift in vogue towards uh, i think there is a shift in vogue um i haven't particularly noticed it much to do with age to be honest i think it's enormously diversity to ethnicity and race and that's been you know very much what he's done and he's sort of, i think he's shifted some of the sort of general comment within it so it's it has a different feel um i mean the thing about alexandra shawn that's interesting is she was herself an, uh, an older woman when when i did the interview mm -hmm. but she was she spoke um I don't think she was terribly sympathetic on the subject. Um, so she didn't say, oh, well, you know. Uh, um, and I think really that, that she sort of um, spoke as a journalist, as yeah. a hard-nosed journalist who would say more or less, look, I know what sells and I know what people want to see and I'm not going to waste time trying to sort of change Vogue into something that's not going to work. I'm, so she's very sort of focused on I'm a professional journalist. And I, th I think... To that degree, what, whatever her own thoughts about her life were, you know, she was quite clear that this wasn't something. She did deal with age um, in the magazine. I've done a sort of analysis of this. She dealt with it through this language of ageless style. So that was very much the theme. And they had a number of um, covers in July, covers that, that it, it, um, addressed this topic. But they weren't ones in which there was much in the way of visual aging. I mean, there was really an actress with a, a slight sort of a slight mark here, as it were, you know, but we, we weren't see we weren't seeing anyone who looked old, really. No, I mean, the the, uh, the one that I so I've written a blog about this. And I think in, in that blog, the, the model that they used was 47, as though that was really daring, you know, to have a 47 year old. Yeah. Office. Yeah. recently yeah. Edward Enfield has put um, Judy Dench on the front cover. Oh, that's right, yes. Uh, yes which is lovely, but nothing much in the magazine um, about it. So it, it 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 was nice to see and, you know, well done him for doing it. But um, and maybe it's a start. Maybe it's, a, you know, it's a little spring shoot there. We, we can hope so. Um, we're coming more or less to the end of our conversation uh, before we split down into our groups. But um, uh, interested to know about men um have you been you've been looking at at the fashion and and, and the male so uh, older men tell us yes, about I, 
uh, having done women, as it were, I did a parallel study with men. Um, and that was very interesting because in many ways, um, men's clothes are different in their lives from women. Men's clothes are much more uniform-like. You know, they, they put them on, it's a suit or it's a, you know, jeans or something like that, and that's it sort of thing. So there's a kind of way in which clothes are more, more straightforward for men. You know, you've only got to think of um, women journalists on television who are constantly getting picked over on that pink top or politicians, women politicians, men politicians, nobody notices, you know, they've just got a suit on. So there's a there's a freedom men have from that uniform approach that's that's very useful. They lose out in some ways because they don't have the pleasure that women, a lot of women have in choosing clothes and have the fun, but they do have that. And one of the consequences of that when they get older is that the issues are less acute. So you don't get men saying, um, for a lot of women, I had something called the changing room moment. The day you go into the changing room, you try on the dress, you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, hmm, not anymore, you know, not, not for me. Now, no, none of the men had that experience at all. Um, some of them had old fashioned clothes they'd had for many years, but they didn't see that negatively. They saw that as old fashioned values, old fashioned clothes, old fashioned values, absolutely right. You know, So it was an affirmation of them as a, an older man who was worth something, you know, a, a man with old, old fashioned values, that was good. So it's a very different experience, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I think it's a whole fascinating area to look at um, as men age and, and what they then choose to wear. I mean. Uh, something we, we could come on to perhaps afterwards in, in the questions but uh, we haven't talked about age ordering as such um, but I think there is with men there is a certain age yes ordering. there is it, they're not they're not they're not uh, immune to all this I think it's less acute but they're not immune to it yeah. exactly perfect so I hope uh, we've got some questions for Julia so let me ask Bryony for you you to ask the questions yes of course um so Julia Leslie would like to know how do you think ladies um of your age can make themselves heard? Oh, difficult one. Um, Big one. <laughs> I don't know if there's a single answer to that. I, I think social change will make spaces where it's easier for older women to speak with confidence. Um, so I think things are getting better, going back to that question we had at the beginning. Um, I don't be bold. Don't be frightened, be loud, that's what I think. I think that's great advice. Um, Carol has asked, what is the definition of ageless style? What does that mean? Well, I don't think it has a definition. I think that tells you something. It's really a kind of term that's used to cover um, this awkward issue. So it's the idea that you can have a style that's not defined by your age. And of course, all of us, I think, will probably say, yes, sure, absolutely. I, you know, I don't the way I dress isn't wholly about my age, it's about the, all sorts of things. So there's, there's a sense in it, but it also means a way of getting around this um, kind of age identification in a more subtle way. Mm. Um, Liz has said that her biggest visual problem is being flat on one side of her chest due to a mastectomy. Mm. She wonders if you've carried out any research into fashion connected with this. I haven't, but there are, I do know of people who've done work precisely on issues around mastectomy. In fact, I think this is, we, we were chatting in the chat room. Um, and there's different views. I mean, again, reflecting on different views by, by women, women differently. Some women don't want to go into the whole business of reconstruction or padding or whatever. They, they, they say, look, that's just how it is, as it were. I mean, that may in part reflect the kind of figure you've got. You know, um, I think that makes it more or less visible. But for others, it's actually really important. And there's certainly been some work on designing pretty mastectomy bras, things like that, that are attractive in themselves. There has been work on that. Um, how do you think the fashion industry is going to change going forwards for women? <laughs> I don't know. At the moment, they're all very taken up with the issue of sustainability, rightly, yeah. because fashion is an absolutely major source of waste around the world. Um, whether they'll actually manage to solve that, I don't know, because there is a kind of dynamic of fashion. You know, fashion companies live on say, selling you something new. And so 
they, they don't really want to stop that. And having got into the fast fashion in the early part of this century, it's very difficult to pull back on that. But I think that's probably something that might happen. Um, I think they'll probably get better at addressing um, this demographic that we've been talking about. They'll find things that work and yeah. And as, as I said, there are some women in this section who have a reasonable amount of money to spend. Um, and, and sometimes, I talked to one woman who'd had actually really financially quite a straightened life. She'd um, been a, a working class woman with um, uh, children. Most of her life, she'd spent her, all the money she had on her children, her family. She didn't have much. She became a widow. And for her, she actually had more spending then than she'd ever had in the rest of her life. Um, you know, she said, I can buy all the colored T-shirts I like now, which she wouldn't have done and couldn't have done when she was younger. Um, a question from Gina. She wants to know, how do you think lockdown has made a difference to the way we dress, regardless of age? Well, I don't know. I have to rely on, on, on newspaper articles on this topic. <laughs> or because I have friends who I see on Zoom calls and things, and I sort of think, what are you wearing? Um, I don't know. There sort of seem to me to be two lots of people. Some people think this is wonderful. I can wear my pajamas all the time. I absolutely lovely. I can slop around in, you know, socks and not give a care. And other people, um, of which I have to be honest, is me, who like just to maintain the rhythm of life about getting up, putting on clothes, doing your hair, kind of whatever. And I feel better like that. Whereas I wouldn't feel if I was sitting here in pajamas and kind of, I wouldn't feel especially, but that's just me and them, you know, so I think there's a variety on this. Yeah. And then just a final question from Dorothy. And um, she said, how do you feel about personal shoppers for older customers? Well, that's very interesting. I would like to ask Dorothy if she's had an experience or, or all of you actually. I haven't myself ever used a personal shopper mm -hmm. and I'd be very intrigued to know whether people thought they were successful and helpful. Well, okay. have we had a couple of yes, please. <laughs> I, I can certainly chip in with that. So um, I did personal shopping when um, my two daughters got married. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I knew that I didn't want to go to a traditional mother of the bride shop. I didn't want to go in. Uh, you've got a really interesting bit in the book. I loved it about uh, Julia, about mother of the bride clothing. And you say it's very much modelled on how the royal family present themselves mm -hmm. when they're opening, you know, in garden parties and things like this. So you're talking about dresses and jackets, quite formal, sometimes with a hat. Uh, colours are often quite, um, you know, uh, pale and delicate. So soft pinks, peaches, soft greens and things like that. And I really didn't want to wear an outfit like that. So I went to um, Selfridges and... Uh, and actually got the outfit that I wore, uh, wore for my daughter's, my first daughter's wedding, um, younger daughter. And then I had this terrible experience where I went back to Selfridges, who had, who had then, uh, by the way, the first time I went to Selfridges, I didn't actually get, uh, have personal shopping as such. I went to one of the concessions and asked the women, one of the, the women in there to help me to choose a complete outfit. She did, and, and I loved what I had. Anyway, the second time I, they had personal shopping available, I went in and the girl on the desk looked at me as if I was something that the cat had dragged in. And she, she, she looked at me and she went, yes. Uh, I was with my older daughter at her wedding and I said, oh, I've come to um, book a personal shopping experience. My daughter's getting married and I'd very much like some help with an outfit. And she said, oh, we only do designer. We do designer. So I said, right. Uh, so she was making an assumption that I couldn't possibly afford designer. So I was so angry and so furious. I actually went home and I wrote the most stinking letter that I've ever written in my life to Selfridges and I, I think I addressed it to Gay, uh, it's a name Gay, Galen Weston or something she's the she's the daughter of the person who owns Selfridges so I wrote this letter I was absolutely disgusted I was treated as though I was you know beneath uh, whatever I wrote the letter and I got a groveling groveling letter back saying can we pay for your daughter's flowers what can we do to make amends um, come in and uh, anyway I got a free Ferragamo bag out of it to cut a long story short <laughs> but I basically went to Liberty's 
So I, I didn't go to Selfridges to buy my outfit. I went to Liberty's, had personal shopping there and got the most fantastic, it was a um, Missoni um, dress from them, had a great experience, lovely and really enjoyed it. So I'd say do it. They don't pressurize you to buy they are going to get you into things you wouldn't normally wear. You can always leave them on the changing room floor and go home if you want to. I'd say do it. I think it's fun. I think it's a nice thing to do. And as I said, having had the disdain of the Selfridges department, I wouldn't recommend that. But certainly, uh, they you know they are available, and uh, and I say go for it. So I don't know whether anybody else wants to contribute to this conversation. Perfect. I think that's it for the questions today. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Bryony. So um, it's just my very great pleasure to say thank you very much, Julia, for that. Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Tricia, for inviting me. I really enjoyed it too. I think it was intriguing to hear what people were asking and, and, and enjoyed our conversation very much. Good. I'm glad. And I'm going to re-recommend your book. So it's Fashion and Age, Dress, the Body and Later Life. If anybody is interested in getting it, it's published by Bloomsbury. And uh, I, I can absolutely thoroughly recommend it. As I said, it, it is quite an academic uh, work, but that's, you know, don't let that <laughs> I shouldn't put you off anyway but it just you will find yourself in the in these pages and it will explain stuff that you kind of know at one level but it will explain it at a much deeper and more profound level and I always love that I love the thought that there is an academic body of knowledge about the thing that I'm actually experiencing as a person myself so uh, that's why I would recommend it to you so um, I've really enjoyed this afternoon and um Again, thank you very much indeed, Julia. You were a brilliant interviewee and uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you. And again, thanks to all of you for coming. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>